Thank you for joining me. I'll be discussing when to treat immune tolerant patients with hepatitis B. And shown here in this table are the different terms used to refer to the different phases of infection. And this patient, which we just described, who's E antigen positive, has a viral load uh, greater than a million, has a normal ALT and minimal evidence of fibrosis and inflammation would be consistent with a patient who's in the immune tolerant phase. Uh, note that the what's considered a normal ALT does vary a little bit by guidance, but uh, generally for women, it's a value under 25. Um, often uh, people use under 20 and for men uh, under 35. And um, the other thing I'll point out is that you'll see different terms used. Immune tolerant is still used to describe this phase for infection. Um, but as I'll show you on the next uh, slide, there is some differences. If you look at the easel guidelines or the apostle guidelines, they have adopted the new terminology. So instead of calling this kind of patient immune tolerant, they use the term chronic hepatitis B infection, infection discerned from disease. So just to recap, you know, typically these are young patients, very often under the age of 30, certainly can be older, but um, very often young. The very high levels of viremia, so not just greater than 20,000, but typically greater than 10 to the seventh I use per ml, and their ALT is truly normal, right? So not normal based on the lab, but normal um, as defined by, you know, women with a value under 30, men value under 35. Now, what's shown in the table, however, is that while all of the guidances, whether you're talking AASLD, easel, or apostle, they're all very consistent in saying you should not treat this patient. They do have some exceptions. And what you'll see is the exceptions are related to basically three factors. One is their age. So ASLD says that when they get to 40 years and older, you should be looking carefully to see if there's a reason why this patient needs to be treated. Easel and apostle use 30 as the cutoff. So again, emphasizing typically immune taller patients are younger. And as you get into the 30 to 40 year olds, you should be thinking about, is this a patient that ultimately is no longer immune tolerant and maybe now in a phase where they need to be treated? So that's one factor. The second is to be attentive to histological disease. So it is important to get information about, you know, is there any evidence of, that the patient has either a significant amount of inflammation or fibrosis? Typically these days we do that using elastography um, in the old days, we might have biopsied such a patient. And the idea is that if you have somebody who has evidence of disease, then that's a patient who no longer fits into this category of immune tolerant, and we should really be offering them treatment. And then the final aspect is family history. So if you have someone who has a family history of HCC in particular, then it is recommended by all the guidance documents that you would treat such a patient regardless of their ALT level or their liver stiffness value, that just based on that cancer risk, you would treat. So, so certainly immune tolerant is still overall a group we don't treat with the exception if they meet one of those other criteria, older age, histological disease, or a family history of liver cancer. Now, the other thing to emphasize is that while a patient may be immune tolerant today, they obviously can transition to a more active phase of disease. And so while you may choose not to treat immune tolerant patient today, know that you need to be monitoring them carefully because they can evolve. And here's just one study to say, when you have an immune tolerant patient that you should be looking for this transition and shown here is the cumulative probability of transition over three, five, seven, and nine years after their initial presentation in the immune tolerant phase. And you can see that by a decade later, more than half have transitioned into that immune active phase. So you need to be looking for it. And in this particular study, they showed that if the ALT level is high, and in their study, high meant greater than a value over 20, that that was a, a patient sort of destined to transition to immune active in the more near future. And, and there's been other studies that have also shown that, that looking carefully at the ALT is quite helpful. That those that have ALTs that are still low, 20 is, 25 is still a low value, but 20, 35, those patients may be more likely to be transitioning to immune active phase than the patient who's got a value that's under 20, for example. So just be attentive to the ALT value because it can give you a clue that a patient who currently looks immune tolerant may be going to be transitioning to more immune active disease in the near future. And remember that, of course, immune active disease is a phase that we treat. Just a little information about sort of how frequently do you find actual disease among the patient who's in this immune tolerant phase. And this is just to highlight that if you were to do biopsies on this patients that you'd be infrequently finding significant disease. So shown here is an initial biopsy and then they did a follow up uh, biopsy five years later in patients that remained in the immune tolerant phase. 
And you can see that uh, the vast majority of the patients either have no fibrosis or very minimal fibrosis F1. So generally, if they're truly immune tolerant, uh, significant fibrosis would be extremely rare, and even with follow-up periods of five years. So now I'm gonna pause and just um, sort of acknowledge though that there is a lot of concern about, around the idea of in these immune tolerant patients, they have very high levels of virus. And we have uh, data from many studies that have shown us in terms of natural history that the viral load is a predictor of future risk of complications, whether that's cirrhosis or liver cancer. And probably the most quoted study around this relationship between viral load and risk of liver cancer is from the REVEAL study. And it's a very important study. You can see it was published back in 2006, but it's remained kind of a cornerstone of our understanding of, of the relationship between virus and outcomes. And as you can see in the figure on the left, that individuals who have viral loads, these are in copies per ml, but if we translate those into IUs per ml, that certainly those that have the higher levels, um, certainly over a million, are at significant risk of having cancer compared to those that have lower levels of virus. And so you would say, well, gee, the immune tolerant patient has very high levels of virus. Maybe that's, that's the rationale to treat. It's not so much that we think they're at risk for getting, they have liver disease, but we're trying to prevent future risk of cancer. And that really, I think, is where the controversy around whether we should treat immune tolerant patients uh, comes from. But I just wanna highlight one important aspect of this study, which is a cohort study, a longitudinal cohort, very important study, but these were not uh, generally immune tolerant patients. In fact, the majority of these patients were over the age of, of were 40 and older. So 67% were over the age of 40. Most of them were E antigen negative. So they aren't the E antigen positive patients that we're talking about with immune tolerance. So this is not really informative in terms of helping us to understand what the risk is for an immune tolerant patient where they don't have any underlying liver disease, where the, the, the patient is young. This is helping us to understand how it is generally across the, the board for patients with chronic hepatitis B, but recognize that these data come from a cohort that is not limited to those with immune tolerant hepatitis B. So if we turn our attention to, to cohorts where they look at the HCC risk in IT patients, not just the overall population of patients with chronic hepatitis B as was done in this study, then we get a very different picture. So in this study, they were very, very careful at being sure to capture just immune tolerant patients, to not let any immune active patients come in or the sort of the whole spectrum. Here, they're really looking to see, does this patient have immune tolerant disease? So they required them to have um, HPV DNA levels that were over 20,000. They had to have an ALT under 40. And then they kind of went further and they sort of excluded anybody who was over the age of 40. In fact, they also excluded patients whose viral load was less than six logs because really truly IT patients have higher viral loads always. And so when they took those IT patients that were untreated and then compared them to just your regular E antigen positive patient who meets criteria for treatment, and then looked at HCC development over about a decade, you can see that they saw no cancers in the untreated IT group, uh, where they did see a, a modest uh, rate of cancer in the treated E antigen positive group. But the, the take home message here was that it, there was negligible risk for HCC over a decade in this group of patients that was well characterized as having immune tolerant hepatitis B. Here's another study in which they, again, were trying to compare what's the risk of cancer in untreated immune tolerant patients versus treated patients who have immune active patients. Those are the patients we do recommend to be treated. And in contrast to the figure that I just showed you on the prior slide where the immune tolerant patients had no cancer, what you can see in this group, which is shown in red, is that they did see a risk of cancer over about a decade's period in the immune tolerant patients that were untreated. And in this particular study, and they did very nice statistics in terms of making sure they were well-matched and doing a competing risk analysis. They showed that the hazard ratio for getting HCC was about two-fold higher in the IT group compared to the untreated IA group. And so they concluded that untreated immune tolerant patients had a higher risk of HCC. And so they concluded in this particular paper that we should be considering treatment. But I wanna um, highlight for you that you have to look carefully at who they are calling IT. So what you can see, this is their table one, and you can see the IT group. So first of all, I'll highlight that their mean age was 38 with a standard deviation of 11 years. So many of these patients would have been over the age of 40. 
you'll notice that the viral loads in um, nearly in about a quarter of the patients was less than six logs. So that's not typical of immune tolerant patients. And then look at the platelet counts. You can see that some of the patients had a platelet count as low as the 160s. Um, so that's a little atypical also for immune tolerance where they don't have cirrhosis and they don't have usually evidence of hypersplenism and low platelet counts. So I would just suggest to you that this was not a clean IT group, that indeed it was a mixture probably of IT patients as well as patients that four or five years of follow-up that maybe even transition to immune active hepatitis B. So the take home message for me from this study is not so much that IT patients have higher risk of cancer, but that IT patients, it's difficult to tell because I don't think this is a clean IT group. And that again, you need to look carefully at age, ALT levels and HBB DNA levels because in this particular study, they clearly have more than IT patients in their IT group because they are not meeting the typical profile for an IT patient. And then I'm gonna close with just addressing the issue of you, if you do treat, and sometimes we do treat immune tolerant adults for various reasons. For example, we would treat young patients who um, have high viral loads who are pregnant. So those are often immune tolerant adults. So we do have to treat occasionally. So, and sometimes we're treating to try to decrease transmission to others, for example, in healthcare workers. So, so there are settings in which they're immune tolerant adults and we do treat, but I wanna highlight for you um, one other aspect related to treatment, and that is that they're challenging to treat in that you can see that it can take some time for them to become suppressed in terms of their HBB DNA levels. So shown here is a study in which they compared tenofovir and tricitabine with tenofovir alone, and the tenofovir alone group is the dark uh, circles. And you can see that even with out to four and five years of follow-up, that the frequency of having patients that had an undetectable HBV DNA level, in this case defined by less than 69 IUs per ml, that only about 60% of the patients actually were able to achieve that, um, meaning that up to 40% didn't have fully suppressed HBV replication, even with nearly years of treatment. So they can be difficult to obtain suppression in. And the other thing to note in the table on the right is that the frequency of achieving the key endpoints that we look for in E antigen positive patients who we put on treatment, which is to lose E antigen or surface antigen, you can see that the rate of such loss is extremely low in the tenofovir alone group in this study, which would be a standard treatment for us to use as tenofovir was only 1.6% after 192 weeks of follow-up and none of the patients lost surface antigen. Now, some have said that potentially immune tolerant patients, you have to break, you have to kind of maybe use more of an immune modulatory therapy in order to get good treatment benefits. So this is a study in which they use the combination of intecavir and PEG interferon for a, a total of a 48 week period. This is a study from the Hepatitis B Research Network. Again, um, in immune tolerant patients, you'll see here that the median age was 37 years, median baseline HBB DNA level was eight logs. But again, in this study they, in which they performed this treatment, when they looked at their primary endpoint, which was 48 weeks after treatment, none of the patients achieved the endpoint of E antigen loss and the achievement of an HBV DNA level under 1,000 at that time point. They had one person who cleared E antigen but still had higher uh, HBV DNA levels. So achieving the endpoints that we desire on treatment is also difficult to achieve in the immune tolerant patient. I'm gonna close with just a recognition though that we have to listen to what our patients are also telling us. And certainly being viremic, being HBV infected is a, a very important sort of experience to acknowledge. And this is a very nice study that looked at kind of patient queries from around the globe, people with hepatitis B sending in questions to the Hepatitis B Foundation and they sort of collated them to kind of highlight the lived experience of hepatitis B. And I just wanna highlight that there are concerns on the part of patients about their transmission to others and, and the stigma associated with being hep B infected. So these do come into play, I think, in terms of some of the decisions we make around uh, treatment of our patients. So in the end, in treating immune tolerant hepatitis B, I'm gonna just list for you sort of the factors for and against. So in favor of treatment is if you do treat and bring the viral loads down, you can importantly reduce the risk of transmission to others. So that's actually one of the situations in which we do offer treatment 
to patients who may be immune tolerant, where we're really going after this goal of decreasing risk of transmission. Again, speaking to the lived experience, there may be benefits in terms of, you know, treating patients. They may feel better with their viral load undetectable. They may feel less at risk for transmission. It may change the way they interact with others. It may reduce stigma. So I think we have to understand that patient experience. And I, and I put in quotations here, may reduce risk of future cancer. Really, we just don't have the data. So I'm not saying that it, it might not be important. It might be important. It's just that we lack the data. Um, and then the factors sort of against treatment and get, and why all the guidelines come down in favor of not treatment treating is because these are individuals that have you know low risk for liver complications, both HCC as well as cirrhosis. I've shown that it's difficult to treat them and get sustained suppression of HBV DNA. And also there are very low rates of the other desired endpoints with treatment such as EN engine loss or S antigen loss. And for that reason, when you commit an immune tolerant patient to treatment, it appears at least at the moment that you're committing them to very long-term treatment. And often these are young individuals, so we have to kind of weigh sort of that consequence of having to be on long-term treatment. So these are the things to consider in treating the patient with hepatitis B. So in closing, national international guidelines are all consistent. They do not recommend treatment for immune tolerant patients, at least under the age of 30, but recognize that age histological stage of disease and the liver cancer history are relevant. So it's those patients that are under the age of 30, no evidence of liver damage and an absent family history of liver cancer that are not recommended to be treated. I've shown you data that when you take truly immune tolerant patients that the risk of cancer is extremely low. It may be as close to zero as you can see, but recognize that immune tolerance move. They move from being immune tolerant to being immune active. And so you wanna be monitoring carefully to be able to pick up that, that transition, make sure you're getting them on treatment in a timely fashion. And the kind of clues that a patient might be in the midst of transition is looking at if their HBB DNA, or DNA levels are declining. Remember that under 10 to the 7th is atypical for patients that are immune tolerant, and that high normal ALTs may also be a clue. When you do treat, you have to acknowledge and make sure your patients are aware that the likelihood that they're going to lose E antigen and S antigen is very low with our current therapies. But I think we're maybe excited about potential future opportunities to treat patients with new drug therapies. But at the moment, what we have to offer uh, does not result in, in high rates of these serological responses. And then I'll just close by saying also, we lack evidence that treatment of these immune tolerant patients will reduce their future risk of HCC. Good evening, everybody from London. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I would like to thank uh, Hai To and Kwang Mi for the invitation, along with the organizers, to be part of this excellent webinar. And it's a real pleasure to have just listened to the talks of Stefan and Irene. So I'm going to build on this and I'm going to focus more on the clinical elements of this. So first of all, I want to just draw your attention to the global uh, burden that chronic hepatitis B represents. If you consider the, the diversity of, of chronic hepatitis B, the numbers of patients that we have to manage, from the East to the African uh, uh, continents, we need to think about how we're going to approach management of chronic hepatitis B better, and then how we're going to deal with the whole concept of HBV integration. One of the key elements of, of HBV DNA integration to me is shown on the bottom quadrant of this slide here, showing you that in hepatitis B, unlike other etiologies, you can develop HCC from what is essentially a normal liver where there may, where, where there may just be chronic hepatitis, in the absence of significant fibrosis uh, or indeed cirrhosis. So that's a key element to really uh, to highlight here and may well be, you know, some of the main reasons why we need to give greater consideration to HPV day integration. This is a slide that I don't want to dwell too much on numbers, but I do think this is important again to highlight uh, the gravity of the situation or, or the challenge that we face. We know that uh, chronic hepatitis B can result in about 800,000 deaths per year. If we look at the latest data from the Polaris Observatory, we see that the numbers of patients treated, the numbers of patients diagnosed is really far too small. So all of these factors are highlighting the challenges that we face in terms of the management of chronic hepatitis B. But one of the key elements, and one of the elements that I stress to my patients when I see them in the clinic, is that those patients uh, with chronic hepatitis B have a 10 to 25% lifetime risk for the development uh, of, of HCC. And this is something that we really need to, to think about. And this is really should be the springboard for how we maybe change our approach to the management of hepatitis B as we move forward into the coming years. 
this is a slide I like to use because if very crudely we divide, um, let's say, potential risk or potential factors driving HCC, we would look at host factors and we'd look at viral and disease factors. And if you just draw your attention to the factors in, in the untreated chronic hepatitis B and development of HCC, I would argue that if you say age over 40 is a key determinant of development of HCC, my argument would be you should treat these patients earlier. If there's a family history of HCC, I would argue that you treat these patients earlier also. Okay, we cannot do much about gender. We cannot do much about where you're born, as we talked about sub-Saharan Africa or Asia. But we can, again, on the viral and disease factors, we can be more aggressive uh, to prevent the development of cirrhosis. We can treat earlier. We can treat viral loads. We can treat elevated ALT. So there are still a lot of factors that we can address. And this is what I use this slide to show you to hopefully mitigate against the development of HCC. The importance of timing of HPV uh, treatment is something that I've uh, been debating for a number of years and is something that I think I'll continue to push in the coming years and I'm sure is something that we'll also touch on in the later phase of the webinar. But if you look at HPV integration, you know, I'm conscious that uh, both Stefan and Irene have covered some of this, but just to think uh, you know, looking at this the cartoon here, that the CCCDNA pregenomic RNA inflammation fibro fibrosis paradigm is what, what we describe as the indirect um, mechanisms associated with our hepatic carcinogenesis, while the HPV integration is the, the direct element of hepatic carcinogenesis that we will focus more on as we go forward. Some of this work stem from previous work that I've done with uh, Bill Mason and Antonio Bertoletti, where we really examined in great detail this immunologically or what was considered immune tolerant phases of chronic hepatitis B. But one of the things that we always argued was that this is not a benign disease phase, so these patients shouldn't be excluded from treatment. And some of our studies have shown that we see the development of clonal hepatocyte expansion, we see HPV integration in these very early stages of disease and in very young people. We also see a preserved virus-specific T-cell response in this so-called immune-tolerant phase of disease. And that's quite important because it may suggest to us that there may be a window of opportunity that we can capitalize on by treating patients earlier. And then finally, from a more public health perspective, by treating patients earlier, we know that we can reduce the pool of HIV infection and possibly reduce transmission in young people. For any of you who are clinicians or working in your clinic, I think this slide's quite interesting because if you take young patients all uh, below the age of 30 in this study, which is published in gastroenterology, the, irrespective of what disease phase they were, Yanchin positive, immune active, or immune tolerant Yanchin, negative immune active disease, that when you biopsy these young patients, we almost always got the same results. So it was a fibrosis stage of one out of six and the Ishak fibrosis stage. And we looked in more detail, we saw very little difference again in terms of collagen proportionate area, suggesting to us that again, that these patients labeled immune tolerant weren't in a state of kind of immunological inertia, but that there was some factors driving some degree of disease. Then I move on to, uh, you know, looking more at the immunological markers. So on the left of this slide, as you look at it, we're looking at a surrogate of immune activity. That's PD-1 and CD8 T cells. And you can see that in those patients labeled uh, E-antigen positive chronic infection from E-antigen positive chronic hepatitis, so formerly e immune tolerant versus immune active, we're seeing very little difference in that degree of, let's say, immune activity when you look at this CDA pop population using uh, the PD-1 positive marker. If you look at CD-127 low PD-1 positive CD-8 cells, a marker of exhaustion, what you're seeing here on the bottom of this slide is that with age, there is a continuous or uh, progressive exhaustion of those T cells. And then that brings me to the publication of Kwang Mi, uh, the Trau paper published in JCI Insights last year, which is a fascinating paper, but really picks up on some important elements here. First of all, there's more work that we need to do to better understand these disease phases and try to disentangle them. But what I found striking about this paper is that, you know, even though we see a lot more immune activity in the immune active phases of the disease, this to me reflects that potentially non-specific inflammatory infiltrate that we get in the immune active phases of the disease. And that may suggest to us that that window of opportunity where there's a, a more calmer uh, liver microenvironment to maybe introduce new therapies may be lost. So I think these papers really match each other very, very nicely in terms of developing some of the ideas 
as we try to move forward and understanding better what patients we should be treating, how we should be prioritizing, and how they may benefit more. But back to some of our pre previous work, and we look at, at clonal hepatocyte expansion, and here I'm showing you these various phases of the disease. And it, we, we know that clone, clone hepatocyte expansion is associated with risk for the development of HCC. We know that the maximum clone sizes are seen in those patients who develop HCC. But let me draw your attention to the top uh, of this slide here, showing you patients as young as 15, 17, and 18 in the immune tolerant phase of disease with uh, clone sizes, which are virtually no different to those patients in the immune active phase of disease, suggesting that there's probably an immune pressure driving this with HV integration and leading to this clone formation. And if we don't do anything about this clone formation, we think these patients are at risk for progressive disease and the complications of chronic hepatitis B, namely HCC development. This really picks up on what Stefan has talked about and even what Irene has talked about. This is just showing you the frequency of HV integrations across at the various disease phases. And the real take home here, as Stefan uh, labeled in, in, in his talk, is that integration is a random event in the human genome. What these integrations are resulting in, this is where the future work will have to uh, be, be undertaken to better understand what these integrations are resulting in. Or can we reduce these integrations? And by doing so, can we reduce some of the sequelae of chronic hepatitis B? This brings me to our more recent publication in GUT from last year. This is looking at integration uh, in those patients with EN to negative chronic hepatitis B, and specifically in those patients formerly labeled as asymptomatic inactive carriers of chronic hepatitis B. Both Stefan and Irene have touched on this, that the surface antigen production that you're seeing in the antigen negative disease is primarily coming from integrated DNA. So it won't come as a surprise to us to see that in patients, below the treatment threshold of 2,000 international units have evidence of integration. And in fact, the integration events that we saw in those patients, looking at the whole exome integration where we see more pathogenicity, is no different whether you're below 2,000 international units and between 2,000 and 20,000 international units. So again, maybe challenging some of those dogmas around treating patients above and below thresholds of 2,000 international units of virus. But these are really important studies because likewise, they're not showing us the integration is just associated, let's say, with the development of HCC, but they're also showing us that some of the cell proliferation, inflammatory responses, the immune responses are also affected by integration. I also want to just highlight this uh, important uh, area around occult B infection. And this is important because this is where we have to think about patients where we don't have the presence of surface antigen, but we may have HPV DNA replicating at very low levels. Well, patients with occult B infection are also at risk for the development of HCC. And it is most likely, as we're showing you in, in this very nice review, that the development of HCC in occult B infection is being driven by or is coming from, again, HPV, HPV DNA integration. I use this slide really just to highlight where the field is shifting and how the field is moving. So if you take it and you look at this, and I've shown you, in fact, in some of the previous slides, and you look at the bottom panel here, I'm showing you CCCDNA, you treat patients with antivirals, and we expect over a period of time, we get significant reduction in CCCDNA, and we get marked, marked reduction to the point that there may be very, very few copies of CCCDNA remaining. Just above that in the panel is the integrated HPV DNA. And what we don't know is, well, what is the effect of treatment in integrated DNA? Are we able to reduce this? We certainly know that, uh, you know, we haven't performed the studies to be able to say that what we see in CCC DNA happens. But we do have uh, the various markers such as HPV DNA, HPV RNA, correlated antigen, which are telling us about some of these factors about the CCC DNA, about reducing transcriptional activity of CCC DNA. But let me draw your attention to the surface antigen line here while on treatment, that you're seeing it remaining almost flat over the course of treatment. So the question becomes, are we able to, uh, you know, are we able to modulate integration by giving antiviral therapy? And if we are able to modulate that, how do we measure it? What's the readout for it? And what's happening to integration at the same time? So this brings me to the Kim paper published in GUT a few years ago, really to me a, a, a seminal piece of work showing us that when you looked at untreated immune tolerant patient versus their uh, immune active peers who were treated, 
Well, the untreated immune tolerant patients did far worse. So those patients had a 10 year risk of HCC, which was two and a half times higher than those with immune active disease who were treated. And they had a 10 year risk of death and transplantation, which was again, 3.3 times the risk of those patients labeled immune active and offered treatment. So those patients with potentially more aggressive disease being treated, doing better than the patients with the benign disease untreated. So if we move this forward, to where we are with the current standard of care of treatment. If I look at what we are doing at the moment, HPV DNA, we can suppress it and we probably should be suppressing it probably early the better. Abnormal liver enzymes, we give antiviral therapy, we can normal, normalize liver enzymes, we're reducing, removing the immune mediated liver damage. Fibrosis, the seminal papers have shown we can achieve reversal of fibrosis. But what happens with HPV integration? Do we know? So let's see where the, the field is now moving and that brings me to two excellent um, studies which are ongoing and, and, and I expect to see very shortly in publication. And this is, first of all, the Chow study, which was presented as of last year. As expected, these are studies looking at paired liver biopsies. And in fact, if I show you here, this is baseline, one year of treatment, and then in a very small proportion of patients, biopsies again performed 10 years later. But it won't come as a surprise to you. HPV, HPV DNA integrate, HPV DNA is suppressed, intrahepatic DNA is almost removed completely, the CCC DNA likewise, but the really important finding here was the significant reduction in median hepat hepatocyte uh, clone size. And this was a first for us in showing us that you have clone hepatocyte expansion, you treat with an antiviral, you go and you look and you're able to see a reduction in that clone size. So this to me is certainly progress and is something that I consider, um, you know, something where we need to look at this in more detail as to where we can actually get to with this. The next study is the Hugh uh, study, also presented at ASL 2020. I'm bringing you back to some of the earlier uh, talks of Stefan and of Irene. You will see that integrations correlate with baseline markers, so very high levels of HPV DNA, we see more integration. But then as the uh, viral load is reduced, we're seeing maybe fewer integrations, but remember, what is the consequence of integration over that period of time? So this study looks at patients who remain on placebo versus those who are treated with an antiviral. And what I'm showing you here in the middle panel is uh, at three years following treatment, you are seeing the full change in integrations after three years of uh, tenofovir therapy. And similarly, if you look at this, you're also seeing the fold changes in integration dysregulated, dysregulated genes after three years of therapy with significant difference in those patients who are treated with antiviral therapy. So in summary here, what we're getting back to is the very, I would say, preliminary data of what antivirals, of what nukes are doing to, um, let's say, the downstream effects of H integration to hepatocyte clone size is just beginning to emerge. But as Irene said, what you're seeing is the use of all these gene mapping of HPV integration using these new technologies such as RNA sequencing. And this RNA sequencing, I think, is really going to give um, a, shed a lot of light on integration, how we manage integration as we move forward. As I stressed earlier, integration frequently involves genes involved in other factors such as cell proliferation, antiviral responses, inflammatory responses, etc. And dysregulated protein coding genes, some of which are cancer related, has been touched on uh, in our study. But the take home here is that nukes can reduce viral genomic perturbation and the downstream effects of integration. So another reason to make that case of treating patients um, with nukes and earlier. So I would suggest that if we talk about treatment, there's a losing argument against early treatment, and that's based around antiviral resistance. We know that there's virtually no antiviral resistance. I think the issue of safety has well and truly been covered at this stage. I think the issues around cost are being addressed all the time. We have access to generic uh, and take a ver, it's an off of her at this stage, which means that cost is not a major issue. And then finally, if you believe in the function cure program, we do not expect that these patients will have a lifelong treatment. So this is not an argument for starting a patient, say, in their second decade or in their early 20s. And I'll finish by these concluding remarks. HPV DNA integration, clonal hepatitis ex expansion are recognized events associated with hepatic carcinogenesis as shown by Stefan and by Irene. I think, you know, bringing back to some of my work, the immune tolerant phase may provide an ideal immunological window for, uh, of opportunity to treat or to use novel therapies. 
you know, although this is going against the grain of what we would have thought previously, but these are certainly things that we need to explore. And for this reason, I say there's a compelling case to treat immune tolerant chronic hepatitis B and indeed to include immune tolerant uh, chronic hepatitis B patients in the functional cure program. And finally, I'd probably go as far as saying as that we should consider treating all patients with chronic hepatitis B with a HPV DNA of greater than 2000. It would make it more a simplified approach to the management of patients. And based on the emerging data, I would say there's certainly a good case which can be made for this. So I finish by thanking you for your attention. I thank you um, again to the organizers and to all my collaborators over the years who've um, contributed to this work. Thank you.